Hey everybody, Dylan here, and thank you for joining me once more for the fourth part of my Hearthstone Knights of the Frozen Throne set review. Uh, today we're going to go over the Paladin, Priest, and Rogue cards. We're going to give each one a rating between 1 and 5, with 1 being absolute garbage and 5 being absolute undeniable excellence that will appear in almost every deck of that class. Some cards will also receive my Silver Star of Excellent Design, uh, which delineates a card that is particularly elegant, explores interesting concepts, or otherwise indicates uh, good game design, regardless of whether or not the card itself ends up being competitively powerful. We're going to review each class from the top to the bottom, going by rarity, so common, rare, epic, legendary, and going alphabetically inside of each rarity category, so if you want to hop around and only see a certain card, you know how to navigate. Without further ado, let's move right along. First up, we've got our Paladin Common Chillblade Champion. This is a 3-2 charge minion uh, with lifesteal for 4 mana. This card is crap. It is barely better than a Priest's Hero Power combined with like a Frostbolt, um, which technically costs 4 mana, but it's really not going to have a place in a Paladin deck when it has to compete with Paladin's historically phenomenal 4 drop slot. You would have to look at doing a card like Chillblade Champion instead of True Silver Champion or Consecration, and that's just not going to happen. Uh, this is a 1 star card. I don't think anyone's going to play this in any competitive deck whatsoever. Next up we have Dark Conviction. This is a two cost paladin spell that sets a creature's attack and health to three. Now this is a very interesting effect. I'm going to give it two stars. Uh, it's not completely useless because we saw similar effects being played on Keeper of Uldaman. Now Keeper of Uldaman also gave you a three three body on a four drop stick uh, and so the effect was costed slightly under two mana. Having it as a standalone effect for two mana uh, is a bit under costed and that's why I'm giving it two stars instead of, you know, a higher score. Um, that said, it does have niche playability. It does set up for certain things like trading your Sunkeeper Terra minions into it or hitting something with a True Silver Champion, etc, etc. I just don't think that it plays a strong enough role to take up a deck slot in a mid-range or control paladin deck. Finally, in our commons, we have Righteous Protector. This is a 1-1, 4-1 with Taunt and Divine Shield. This is a 5-star card. Every paladin deck that is ever run is going to have two copies of Righteous Protector without fail. It is simply too efficient, it stifles aggro, it can block big guys in the late game, it's a 1-1 one, one for 1 that you have to kill twice, it's an urgent squire but they can't just go face around it, they have to fight through it, that is absolute and utter insanity. This is a 5 star card that I will name without hesitation, this is my most confident 5 star rating in the set by the way, absolutely bombastic card. Okay moving on to our rares, we've got Arrogant Crusader, this is a 4 mana 5-2 with a death rattle of if it's your opponent's turn summon a 2-2 two, two ghoul so it's kind of like a 7-4 for 4 so it's 3 health short of a 4 mana 7-7 seven, seven. Uh, but like a lot of the other cards such as Vrygul and Skelomancer I just don't think this card has what it takes because a smart opponent is going to have too many options to play around it. This is a little better than Vrygul because it has four, uh, 5 attack um, and that makes it able to put a lot more damage out and make it a little bit more threatening however the downside of course is that its overall health is still only four on a four drop, which is still really weak, and that's if you get the effect. I'm gonna give it two stars. I think it has some niche playability, possibly in an extremely aggressive deck, because it would demand that they trade into it to prevent the damage to themselves. As always, it also functions as a doomsayer counter or a counter to other sort of uh, predictable board clears. But in general, I just don't think this card is very good. Next up, we have Desperate Stand. This is a two cost paladin spell that gives a minion death rattle, resummon this minion with one health. Uh, so this is a strictly worse version of Ancestral Spirit, but because of the class it's in, it actually ends up being way better. This is a three star card, believe it or not, because there are so many phenomenal cards in Paladin specifically that can exploit this effect to great power. You've got Tyrion Forging, You've got Wicker Flame Burn Bristle, you've got Ragnaros Light Lord, and those are just three legendaries off the top of my head. If these come back at one health, you're probably getting an extra activation of their extremely potent effects. It's a three star card because I think you're only going to see it in actual control paladin, 
um, where it's looking to kind of get the most value ever out of everything in kind of an obsessive manner. But nonetheless, I think it is an easy card to underestimate and it is one that will see some fringe playability. This card also gets my silver design star uh, because despite being a strictly worse version of another card, it actually ends up being significantly more powerful. And that demonstrates an understanding of the fundamental differences between the different classes in Hearthstone and the tools that are available to them. And it also encourages the player to be cognizant of those differences as well. When you see this card and you see it alongside Ancestral Spirit from Shaman, you're gonna say, well, what, why is this just worse? Because they don't normally print strictly worse versions of cards. It's, it makes you think a newer player might then discover and come to understand some of the Paladin's class identity uh, in a sort of organic manner being taught and provoked by this card. Uh, and that's why it gets my Silver Star of Design in addition to a three star rating. Howling Commander, this is a two two for three with a battle cry of draw a Divine Shield minion from your deck. This is also a three star card specifically because it can draw Wicker Flame Bird Bristle and Tyrion Foraging. And that is literally all it needs to be able to do to become a decent enough card for a mid-range or a control deck that wants to try and get the extra value and get reliable uh, on-curve plays of high-value minions. Because Paladin has such excellent Divine Shield minions, this, even though it's kind of understated, ends up being a reliable way of drawing an extremely powerful card. Uh, not much more to say than that. It gives you a 2-2 body, which is obviously undercosted significantly for a 3-3, but drawing not only a card, but a reliably excellent card definitely gives this a 3-star rating. All right, moving right along, we've got Blackguard. That's how you would really say that. Not Blackguard, but Blackguard. I like to say it that way anyway. Uh, this is a 3-9 for 6 mana that whenever you are healed, it deals a random enemy target that much much damage. Uh, this is actually a three star card as well uh, because it is only really going to be useful in decks that are playing a significant amount of healing. Now in your average Paladin deck you do have things like True Silver Champion uh, and this can allow Blackguard to deal two damage to a random target. But the problem is that it has to do a lot more than that to be worth its stat costing. It's actually one stat under, it's 12 stats for six mana. Um, however, if you play this alongside things like Ivory Knight, it suddenly becomes way, way scarier, right? So if you drop this and the turn after you drop an Ivory Knight and choose, say, a Spike Ridge Steed, you're also put, you're getting a free Fireball. And with nine health, it's actually feasible for it to sur survive a turn, even as a six drop. So yeah, this is a three star card. I think you'll see it played in mid range decks and some control decks, any of them that actually play a significant number of healing effects. And don't get me started on the meme videos of when someone plays this and then on the next turn heals themselves for 20 with forbidden healing and kills their opponent instantly. That's going to be good stuff. Our other epic is Light Sorrow. This is a one attack, four durability, four mana weapon that gains uh, plus one attack every time a minion loses divine shield. This card is terrible. One star. Uh, it is a Light's Justice that costs three extra mana that if you're lucky might be a 2-4 when you play it that you really cannot reliably count on for it to be any better than a Parada launcher that doesn't give you minions. A 1-4 stat line is just not high enough as a base. If this was a 1-5 or a 2-5, maybe we could get talking because you'd have it and play long enough for it to actually accumulate some power, but it can't come down on turn four unless you have managed to play Divine Shield minion on turn three and have it not only survive, but keep its Divine Shield and even in that best case scenario, it's still only a 2-4 if your Burn Bristle keeps its Divine Shield and then you pop it against something, which is not always an option either, on turn four. Terrible card, one star, it looks way better than it is, don't fall for it. Moving now into Legendaries, we've got Bolvar, Fireblood. He is a 1-7 for five mana with Divine Shield, and whenever a minion loses Divine Shield, he gets plus two attack. So this guy, I think, is kind of also deceptively powerful uh, in a way that is similar to Howling Commander. Um, Bolvar is a three star card. He will get played in mid range decks specifically. And the reason he will get played is because Paladin actually doesn't have a lot of good five drops. Um, in fact, I can't name any off the top of my head that I'm terribly excited about when I'm thinking about building a Paladin deck. Oh, uh, so this this five cost minion goes into this deck. Obviously, there are none. Um, and because of that, his kind of circumstantial power level is increased. Uh, when he comes down, he's often going to be a 3-7 because you can maybe expect to have one Divine Shield minion to trade away. When they punch into him, he then immediately becomes at least a 3-7, often a 5-7, and that is a perfectly respectable stat line for a 5-drop minion. So this is a 3-star card. I think you will see it played 
in some mid-range decks that want the five drop and want a little bit more mid-game uh, board presence, he's going to mostly trade against things, but occasionally he'll just go nutso and blow your opponent out and attack for 11 or whatever. Again, highlight video fodder, but it'll be exciting. It'll be fun. And our final Paladin Legendary. This is Uther of the Ebon Blade. Uh, he's a nine cost Death Knight. He gives you five armor like any other Death Knight. Uh, as a battle cry, you equip a 5-3 weapon with lifesteal and he changes your hero power to summon a 2-2, and if you've summoned all four horsemen, destroy the enemy hero. Right off the bat, I'm going to go ahead and say this is a five-star card. Just for starters, a nine mana, gain ten, gain five more the next two turns is really good. After that, changing the one ones you summon with your hero power into two twos is also really good. And on top of that, you can add the Exodia effect, where if you manage to use the hero power four times in a row unperturbed, or you manage to, to juggle and bounce the tokens in some weird way that lets you get all of them down and then activate the hero power for the win, it's just a straight up additional win condition. They can pierce through ice block, they can pierce through 100 armor, whatever. Uh, so this card is very, extremely powerful. I think you're going to see it in almost every Paladin deck, except the very most front-loaded, super aggressive decks. Uh, it also gets my Silver Design Star because it is just oozing with flavor. When you look at this card and you look at its effects, it just immediately calls to mind the idea of a fallen Paladin, a Paladin who has succumbed uh, to the strength and the temptation of the Scourge. And on top of that, the, the, the hero power that this guy gives you is just so sexy despite not being super good it's just immediately demands that you try to build a deck around it it immediately is tantalizing to players that like to play these extremely value oriented greedy decks it's one of only a very few true alternate win conditions that that exist in this game it's actually the only one that straight up just says do this win the game. I'm kind of counting open the way gate as an alternate win condition as well. Um, but this is the only card so far that just straight up wins you the game as part of its effect. Love this card. Five star rating. It gets the silver star. Fantastic tool in almost every paladin deck. Moving on, we've got our priest commons. First up, we've got Acolyte of Agony. This is a 3-3 three, three for three with lifesteal. So what we have here is Blizzard kind of trying to figure out how to evaluate lifesteal as a mechanic. How much is it worth? What does it cost? How do we budget it? What they've come to is that it's worth about one health off of an otherwise vanilla 3-4 three, for 3. I really don't think this is good enough. Um, if we didn't have Cabal Talon Priest and Priest was still starving for 3 drops, this might get 4 stars, but it gets 3 stars in its current incarnation. Uh, as a 3-3, three, three, the chance of it being able to recursively gain you health is extremely low. It's probably only going to get traded into or maybe go face and die to a spell. At best, it gets you 6 health, and in that case, it's actually pretty good, but I just think it's too fragile and it doesn't have enough of a board presence uh, to justify the very coveted 3 slot in any Priest deck. Uh, Aggro Priest isn't really a thing, therefore the number of slots for lower mana cost uh, creatures and spells is more limited, and I don't think this makes the cut. We've got Shadow Ascendant. This is a 2-2 two, two for 2 that gives another random minion plus 1 plus 1 at the end of your turn. Uh, so this is obviously Young Priest. This is bigger, meaner, older sister. Uh, it costs an additional mana, but it has an extra health and it gives its beneficiary an extra health as well. Unfortunately, I think it's too slow. Uh, Plaguing on a curve is going to require you to have a one drop that is out and alive. The only one drop Priest has that they care about is Northshire Cleric, and you don't usually want to play Northshire Cleric on turn one if you can avoid it. Um, as such, I'm going to give this two stars. I don't think it's good enough to see play in any existing deck. If a new archetype arises that's some kind of like tempo minion combat oriented priest, maybe we could see this card. But because it, it itself is so fragile and the effect is so nominal unless you get it to recur, uh, I don't think it's going to be good enough to see play in any deck. Next up, we have Spirit Lash. Uh, this is a two cost priest spell that deals one damage to all minions, but it has lifesteal. This card is three stars because it gives Priest a much needed additional early game tool against aggro. The problem is that it does slightly too little damage and it hits your own guys, which does cause you to gain more life from the lifesteal part of this. You can expect to probably gain between three and five life when you cast this, which makes it competitive with flash heal in terms of pure healing uh, output. But I just don't think that it is quite good enough to be in every deck. Uh, I think that if Kazaka's Priest becomes a thing again, this will it'll definitely play a copy of this. Um, I think that uh, Control Priest, like Hard Control Priest, will probably play a copy of two of this as well in order to combat extremely powerful early aggro plays. 
Uh, but in general, I think because it's a true whirlwind effect and not a enemy damage only effect, it's not quite good enough. All right, and we're gonna get into our priest rares now. Our first one is Devour Mind. This is a five cost priest spell that copies three cards from your opponents that can put them into your hand. So. This is, you know, a, a strictly uh, analogical comparison. Uh, Thought Steel is to Arcane Intellect as Devour Mind is to Nourish. Um, unfortunately, it's probably not good enough because it's not drawing you actual cards. Uh, Thought Seal doesn't actually appear in any major decks right now because it draws you your opponent's cards and those are not as likely to mesh with your game plan. Devour Mind has the exact same problem. You tack on two mana, you add an additional card, but you don't change the fundamental, I guess, character of it. Um, and for that reason, I'm only going to give this card two stars. I don't think there's any major deck archetype that is going to want to play this card that's going to want to have Devour Mind in a slot on purpose. Sometimes you're going to get off of Lyra and then you're going to play it for two, you know, three or four mana and you're going to get three extra cards. Some of them are going to be spells and you're going to keep going off. That's going to be kind of cool. But in general, I don't think this is worth a card slot in your deck on purpose. All right. Eternal Servitude. This is a four cost pre spell. Discover a friendly minion that died this game and summon it. So this is interesting. You remove the body from Onyx Bishop and you make it only cost four mana. But in exchange, you also get to discover the minion. The discover part is what pushes this card way up. We're gonna give it a three stars because I'm not sure that Resurrect Priest is a viable archetype. If it becomes a viable archetype, this goes up to four stars. But the card itself is very powerful because it allows you to dodge the normal downfall of resurrection effects. Resurrection oriented decks tend to be mid range and control oriented decks by nature, which means they're gonna play cards like Doomsayer or they're gonna play cards that have battle cry effects that aren't great to resurrect. When you have this card, it allows you to effectively completely dodge ever getting Doomsayer off of this effect ever, unless you really want one. Um, and that is almost immeasurable. It's almost incalculable how much better a resurrection effect becomes when you actually have control and the ability to select the most appropriate card for the situation you're playing in. So this is a three star card. And if Resurrect Priest does become a thing, I think you'll see this in every single one. All right. Shadow Essence. It's a six cost spell. Uh, summon a five five copy of a random minion from your deck. So the immediate thing that comes to mind here is that it's a five five for six. And the only minions that are good to get with this are ones with death rattle effects or runs ones with aura effects, ones that have effects that are always on. Obviously, the dream here is that you hit obsidian statue. Do you play this in a deck that only plays creatures that cost eight or more? Do you play this in a deck that only plays creatures that have effects you kind of want to get that uh, bonus instance of? And even in those decks, is it worth paying six mana for a five five copy of such a creature? Fundamentally, you're always going to be having an understated version no matter what you summon. Uh, based on the mana cost of the spell. For that reason, I'm going to give this two stars. I see a glimmer of potential here in it pulling out things like Priest of the Feast or Malagos or something like that. But because it's six mana and it always summons a five five, I feel like it's not reliable enough and it doesn't really have a home in any major archetype right now. All right, moving into our Priest Epics, we've got Embrace Darkness. This is a six cost. Choose an enemy minion at the start of your turn. Gain control of it. So this is a this is a mind control, right? It's a 10 mana mind control with a four mana discount because it is permuted into being a corruption style effect it doesn't go off until the beginning of your next turn. Now, this has some really interesting implications. Uh, this encourages the opponent to trade the minion away and thus negate your effect. It encourages the opponent to damage the minion so it's not as strong when you get it. It encourages the opponent to set up knowing that you're going to have whatever minion you're taking from on the next turn. The problem is that there's only so much you can do to play around this if it gets played on a particularly big powerful minion. If you hit someone's Primordial Drake or their City and Statue or whatever else, their, 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 their Lich King with this, it will often be hard for them to get rid of it and you, you will then get to take it. Um, it's going to be best on cards that have death rattles and recurring effects rather than just bodies because the bodies will almost always be able to be eroded, but being able to steal away an instance of an end of turn effect or a death rattle is quite good. Uh, this is a four star card. I think you're going to see it in basically all mid range and control oriented pre step. This also gets my silver design star. Um, it's very interesting to take the drawback of a card like Corruption and then take a card like Mind Control and kind of smush them together and get this kind of weird permutation on the Corruption effect. Uh, it plays completely differently from Corruption. 
because the stakes become far higher. If they aren't able to do something with their creature with corruption, they just lose the creature and that's not the end of the world. But when you play Embrace Darkness, they have to do something or you get the creature. It adds a great deal of tension, uh, puts a lot of pressure on the opponent to try to figure out what they want to do and how they react to it. Uh, and for that reason, I think it creates a lot of interesting game states. It creates a lot of interesting decision matrices, both for you and your opponent. And those are the hallmarks of a great card. So Silver Design Star, uh, four star rating. This is a pretty solid card. I think you're going to see a lot of it. Moving on to our other priest epic, we have Obsidian Statue. This is a four eight taunt with lifesteal, four nine with death rattle destroy a random enemy minion. Uh, this is a four star card because it just it just does everything. It's got an eight health body to tank with because it has taunt. It gets you four health every time it deals damage and it has eight health. So the odds of that being a recurring effect are extremely high. And it has a death rattle so that even if this card does get removed through anything other than hex, devolve, polymorph type effects, it's going to at least take out one random minion. So this can take out large minions because it has the death rattle. It can take out a swath of small minions because it's got a, a, a health oriented body and it gets you back in the game even if you're behind against aggro by giving you a ton of lifesteal. As long as you don't get this card just transformed and run through, it's going to be very, very strong. Uh, four star card. I think every deck is going to every priest deck is going to play this. I don't see any priest deck not including at least one copy of this card because it simply offers so much value in one package. Priest legendaries. So we've got the meme king himself, Archbishop Benedictus. He's a four six for seven with a battle cry of shuffle a copy of your opponent's deck into your deck. So generally, this is going to take around 15 cards from your opponent and put them into your deck. It looks like this lets you basically win any fatigue-oriented, control-oriented matchup. The problem is that that's not entirely true. The cards that you're taking from them are not going to fit into your game plan at all, and you're going to get the shitty ones that are still on their deck as well as the good ones. So if you're fighting an aggro deck, this card is a complete dead card because it's just going to fill your deck with a bunch of 1-2 fireflies that aren't relevant to your role as an obviously in-game oriented uh, control priest. So it becomes a dead card against aggro. It's a mediocre card against mid-range. It's an, a pretty strong card against control, but there are better tools against control and fatigue isn't generally how you're going to be trying to win every game. Like it's a thing that happens sometimes, but it doesn't need to be your game plan. Um, on top of all that, he's only a four six body on a seven mana creature that's almost a full three mana over costed i can only give this guy two stars despite all of his crazy meme potential i think he is really cool i think he has a potential to be a blowout but i think nine times out of ten when you play him he's just gonna kind of be a disappointing old bald guy um and that's just how it is and our final priest legendary is shadow reaper anduin uh he is an eight mana death knight he gives you five armor like every death knight uh, as a battle cry, he destroys all minions with an attack of five or more, uh, and he changes your hero power into deal two damage to a target, refresh this hero power when you play a card. Um, so this is a four star card. I think most priest decks are going to make use of him, but particularly I think he's going to become the cornerstone to the return to viability of Kazakus Raza Priest. Um, because you got things like Obsidian Statue and Embrace Darkness and Spirit Lash, and Eternal Servitude potentially, all from this set, and that's just discussing the class cards that are good. On top of Shadow Reaper Anduin, um, that's five extra cards, four to five extra cards that you can now say are quite good enough to earn a slot into the Kazakus Priest deck, and that raises the average power level a lot. It adds in a tool for handling early game aggro, which is how Kazakus Priest normally loses. It adds in Shadow Reaper Anduin, which adds a whole lot of in-game pressure, which is fine because that's actually when you need your hero power the least. Um, and destroying all five attack minions is a really good counter against enemy control decks and mid-range decks alike. It's just a very powerful card all around with kind of a cool thematic feeling. There are going to be games where you set this up with a Raza, you have the zero cost version of, of his void power, and you just use that every time you play a card for the rest of the game. You're going to win most games where you're able to set that up and you're not already in a horrendous position. Very good card. You're going to see a lot of it in most priest decks. All right. And finally, we're going to move into our rogue commons. First up, we have Bone Baron. Bone Baron is a 5-5 five, five for 5 with a death rattle of put two 1-1 one, one skeletons in your hand. Skeletons cost one mana themselves. 
Uh, this is a two star card. It's obvious what this is trying to do. It's trying to enable this play lots of cards archetype. You know, it's trying to enable you for things like Sherizen uh, or Spectral Pillager, which we'll see in a little bit. But the problem is that I don't think Rogue can afford to play understated minions uh, that only give you additional stats off of them by paying more mana. I don't think that's good enough. Rogue is an extremely tempo oriented cl class by nature, uh, and I think this card doesn't make the cut just because it's too slow. All right, our second Rogue common is Leeching Poison. It's a two mana spell that gives your weapon lifesteal. Uh, on its surface, it seems like that's really weak. If you use it with your hero power, you're only getting two health. But if you use it with deadly poison in your hero power, you get six health for two mana. And if you use it on an assassin's blade, you get 12 health for two mana. And if you use it on an assassin's blade with deadly poison, you get 20 health for two mana. Uh, it also has a really cool synergy with uh, Doomerang, which we'll get to in a minute, uh, because it allows you to basically target and get health even while using your weapon as a removal tool and not take face damage, which lets you get even more health as a net. Uh, this is actually going to be a three star card. Rogue is so desperate for lifesteal, but I think even though this card is kind of inflexible and unreliable, it'll still get played in some rogue decks that are looking to play the long game, uh, like uh, Death Knight oriented rogue decks that are trying to do weird combo stuff or shadow caster stuff. Um, you're not going to see it in most rogue decks, but I think it will actually get fringe playability in serious decks that are combo and control oriented with a focus on the light game because it's just going to help you get there. All right, our last rogue common is Plague Scientist. He's a 2 3 for 3 with combo, give a friendly minion poisonous. Um, this guy has a lot of potential, but the problem is that his stats aren't good enough. Much like with Bone Baron, Rogue is very tempo oriented, and if they lose the board, they really struggle to win the game. Um, while this is cool and can enable you in the late game to set up some sort of trade with a small minion into a big minion using Poisonous, uh, it's very, very bad on curve. Uh, it's a very bad draw when you don't have minions on the board. Uh, it's only really good when it's drawn in the mid, the mid to late game on a turn where you have a good play to enable the combo with and you have a minion that you're willing to trade in and you have a big enough minion that it's worth trading in uh, it's kind of the same problem although not nearly as bad as toxic arrow uh, in hunter uh, this is a two star card it's really not good enough to see play in any existing rogue deck perhaps if some rogue deck that truly needs an additional hard removal effect on a body comes into existence then they'll play this guy uh, but i really don't see that happening all right, moving on to our rogue rares. We've got to roll the bones. It's a two mana spell that says draw a card. If that card's death rattle, play this card again. This is a really interesting spell. Um, it's going to be three stars for me. The proportion of death rattles in your deck for this to proc uh, about half the time is only, I believe, uh, the math I saw said about uh, 10 to 10 to 11 death rattle cards. If I'm wrong, comment and, and let me know that my math is off and, and feel free to explain it. I should have done it myself, but I just decided to trust Reddit. Um, but you know, working off of that understanding, this is draw one and a half cards for two mana. Sometimes draw only one card, but sometimes blow out and draw two to three cards. That's worth it in decks that want to play cheap spells. Uh, that's worth it in like Shares and Rogue if that is a thing. Uh, as a result, I'm going to give it three stars because I think it will see niche play in decks that are, are death rattle and multiple card play oriented, such as like a Shares and Rogue. Um, and that will be just good enough for there, but you're not going to see it in other decks. All right, Runeforge Haunter. This is a 5 3 for 4 uh, with an aura effect that says your weapons do not lose durability during your turn. Um, this is a two star card that had the potential to be a four star card if its stat line was flipped. If this was a three five with that effect for four mana, I would give this four stars and I think almost every rogue deck would play it. Because it's a five three, it gets traded into by a two drop. It's effectively going to read five three battle cry. Your weapon gets plus one durability. And that's really not all that great. It's not horrible, but it's really not good enough to warrant an intentional deck slot in a constructed format. Uh, it's too fragile, it gets traded into too easily, and you have to recur the effect in order for it to really be worth it. As a result, two stars, I don't think you're gonna see a blade. All right, Shadow Blade. This is a three mana, three two, so the, the classic uh, weapon stat line, three attack, two durability, but it has battle cry, your hero is immune this turn. That is super, super good. It basically means the first time you swing with the shadow blade, you don't take damage back for the minion you clear, and that is exactly what your mid range and your control oriented rogues need. They need an additional tool for handling two to three health minions in the mid game that isn't using up their eviscerates or trading their minions in constantly. This is actually gonna be a four star card. 
I think most rogue decks are going to find a place for this. Uh, we've seen Paladin decks play Rallying Blade literally without ever expecting the battle cry to go off. We've seen Eagle Horn Bow get played in Hunter with no secrets in the deck. So with this being a 3-2 for 3 that has a very relevant battle cry, because you're almost always going to attack on the same turn you equip a weapon, it's kind of unheard of to equip a weapon from hand and then not attack with it that turn in Rogue. Uh, I think this card's actually really good. It's going to let you remove medium to big targets depending on how it combos. It's going to go up Leeching Poison and Deadly Poison. Uh, and it goes really well with Doomerang, which we're going to go over in a second. Four star card. I think it's awesome. Speaking of, here's our first rogue epic. This is Doomerang. It's a one mana rogue spell. You throw your weapon at a minion, deal damage equal to its attack, and then the weapon goes back into your hand. Um, so this is a four star card, and let me explain why. First of all, uh, the card isn't super clear about what I'm about to tell you. When you throw a weapon that's on its last durability, it is not destroyed. It expends a durability, first of all, when you cast this spell, but if it goes to zero durability, it still comes back to your hand, and the damage still activates any keywords that are associated with the weapon. So if your weapon is poisonous from a venom, uh, venom weapon, boom, you doomerang something, it's dead. If your weapon is life stolen, boom, you doomerang something, you still get the health, and you don't take the face damage and it adds a copy of the weapon you've expended the one durability from back to your hand. Now if you cast this before it's on its last durability you obviously lose all of that remaining durability but you're almost never going to do that. The only card that you might find yourself stuck having to do that with would be something like an assassin's blade but even then at most you're going to sacrifice maybe one or two of the durability because you're always going to be able to attack with it once before you doomerang and then expend a second durability when you throw it. Uh, this card is phenomenally powerful. This is another card that's going to single-handedly enable mid-range and control to live. Um, this is the card that Blade Flurry died for, but you should appreciate it because it's actually a really good card. Uh, our other rogue epic is Spectral Pillager. This is a 5-5 five, five for 6 with combo deal damage equal to the number of other cards you played this turn. Um, this is unfortunately nowhere near as hype as Shadow Blade or Doomerang. This is a 2-star card uh, because it is fundamentally a 5-5 five, five for 6. While it does have a proactive effect, it's not going to have a proactive effect when you play it on curve. Uh, and you're going to have to kind of artificially fill your deck with things that give you more spells to play. Um, I almost gave this three stars because it will maybe see play in the kind of Sherez and multi-card deck, but I actually think it just costs too much to realistically enable the big hit that it would need to be able to, to apply in order to make it worth playing on purpose when it would sometimes only be a deal one damage, get a 5-5 five, five for six. Uh, so it's a two-star card. It's just a little bit overcosted. If this had a smaller body and a smaller mana cost, it would be way better. But in its current form, I just don't think it's good enough. Our first rogue legendary is Lillian Voss. She is a four mana, four five, so straight up Yeti stats. With a battle cry of replace all spells in your hand with random spells from your opponent's class. Uh, this is a three star card. The reason it's not better is because most decks play spells they want to play. Uh, this is only really going to be good in decks that play a large number of low cost spells like maybe Miracle Rogue as a card that is going to let them pivot into being able to play a more aggressive control game that gets more value out of the spells in their hand. Um, it is okay with things like Razor Petal Volley and Razor Spine Lasher or whatever that guy's called that gives you a single Razor Petal, um, but I just don't think it's good enough with most things because it doesn't let you pick which spells. Um, there are going to be times where you're going to want to get rid of some spells in your hand, but you've got some spells in your hand that are really good. You don't want to get rid of your prep. You don't want to get rid of your uh, your eviscerate. You don't want to get rid of your sap or whatever, but you do want to get rid of like that fan of knives that you have. She doesn't really let you do that. Um, she's a three star for that reason. I think she's very close to a four star. The body is solid. Um, she's a four five for five. You can't go wrong with Yeti, but the effect is just slightly too hard to control. Uh, for you to see this played in many rogue, de rogue decks. There will be some decks that play it, certainly. I do not think you will see it played in many decks. All right, and our final card for this video is Valera the Hollow. She has five armor, like every other Death Knight card. She costs nine mana, uh, and her battle cry is very simple. She gives you, the hero, stealth for one turn. That is an amazing effect. That means you can dodge uh, mage burning you out, it means that you can dodge minions attacking you, it means you can dodge any number of things that kill you. The only thing that kills you while this effect is up is an AoE, and she gives you 5 armor when you play her. So the odds of you dying are basically zero when you play Valera the Hollow. Her hero power though is what's really interesting. Her hero power is called Shadow Reflection. This is the first hero accessible passive hero power uh, in Hearthstone, so very momentous. Uh, it each turn adds a shadow reflection card to your hand 
the shadow reflection becomes a copy of every card you play when you play it. So let's say you have an eviscerate, you play the eviscerate, your shadow reflection is now an eviscerate. If you then play a prep, the shadow uh, reflection becomes a prep. So you can't lock it in. You also can't keep it between turns. At the end of every turn, the shadow reflection goes away and comes back at the beginning of your turn. However, it is still very close to a hero power that's zero mana draw a card, with the restriction being that it only draws cards for you that are already in your hand, but it doesn't draw them out of your deck. I'm actually only going to give this three stars because while this revival effect is really cool, only certain decks like Miracle or like Sherizen Rogue are going to be able to truly exploit Shadow Reflection and get significant value from it because it can really only be useful with cards that cost five or less. And any card that costs more than five, you're not going to have any good way to copy it with Shadow Reflection and play it because if you try to play a counterfeit coin or something like that to get that other spell or card down to a lower cost or to give yourself mana afterwards, it's going to copy that other thing. It's going to mess you up. Um, it's also going to get my silver design star, though, because the play and the interesting combos and stuff like that that you can get from the shadow reflection passive are just phenomenally complex. Uh, this is another example of Team 5 finally embracing combo play as a real and valid op option. And Hearthstone, we haven't seen a combo tool like this for Rogue since Shadowcaster Bran was in the meta. Um, and I think that people are going to do some really crazy, ridiculous stuff with this in the same way they did it with Shadowcaster Bran. I'm really looking forward to see what people manage to figure out about this. Uh, Shadowcaster maybe will make a return because you can cast a one copy of a card from your hand and Shadow Reflection still becomes an actual copy of that card, so you can get two Malagoses uh, off of that one shadow casted Malagos, for example. Um, really awesome card, only gets a three star rating because I think it'll be limited in its relevance, but for the classes that do want to play it, it's very, very good. So that's it for the Paladin, Priest, and Rogue cards. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, the next video will have the remaining cards, and we'll have one more video after that with some predictions, summaries, tips, tricks, and top fives uh, from me. Uh, make sure that you like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoyed this video. If you think everything I said is totally, completely wrong, tell me how stupid I am right down there in the comments. I would really love to hear your opinion, which I respect very highly. Make sure you share this video if you enjoyed it, and I will see all of you in the next video for the remaining 30 cards in the set. Take it easy. I'm out of here.